The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome to the Better Buildings Alliance Renewables Integration Team call. I'm going to wait just one more minute for more people to join the call and then we will begin. Thank you. Hey, hello and welcome to the Better Buildings Alliance Renewables Integration Team Call. This is Rose Langner from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. I'm the technical lead for this Better Buildings Alliance team. Today's call, we will be talking about electric vehicles and their integration into buildings and the grid. And I'm very excited to have two presenters today. We have Myung-Soo Jun from NREL's Transportation and Hydrogen Systems Center and Tristan Coffin from Whole Foods Market. Next slide. The Better Buildings Alliance serves as a platform for commercial building owners, managers, and industry partners to share and deploy innovative, cost-effective energy-saving solutions for greater adoption of advanced technologies, more profitable businesses, and better buildings. Next slide. The renewables integration team specifically focuses on the strategic use of renewables in our commercial building stock building load flexibility and grid coordination to understand how our building stock can be an asset to our power grid. And our aim is to provide resources, information, and guidance on these topics to you, building owners and managers. We also look to our Better Buildings Alliance members for input on possible research, research or resources needed to help make better decisions on these topics as well. So please don't hesitate to reach out to us. We're always happy to engage on conversations within the Renewables Integration Team focus. Next slide. The agenda for today's call is as follows. I will spend about 10 minutes going over our call introduction and quick announcements. This will be followed by two 20-minute technical presentations on electric vehicles. And lastly, we hope to leave at least 10 minutes for Q&A. Please note that this call is being recorded and we do encourage your participation in the discussion at the end. All attendees will be muted, but you can type your questions into the question box um, as part of the GoToWebinar control panel um, and we will address them at the end. If we don't get to all of the questions at the end, then we will hopefully follow up with most of them uh, via email after the call. Next slide. So some quick introductions to the Renewables Integration Team. Again, I'm Rose Langner. I'm an architectural engineer in the Commercial Buildings Research Group at NREL. I'm the technical lead for the Renewables Integration Team. Next slide. Navigant is also on board providing technical team support. Uh, we have Theo Kasuga, who is a managing consultant in the energy practice at Navigant. In his five years with Navigant, Theo has worked on a variety of topics, including demand response, grid interactive buildings, cost and potential studies, and mandatory efficiency standards. Theo works closely with government agencies, utilities, and consortia to promote building efficiency and interactivity. Bill Getzler is also part of the team. He is a managing director in Navigant's energy practice. He, his work focuses on energy efficiency and renewable energy, providing technology and market assessments, policy analysis, and strategic planning assistance for government agencies, utilities, and manufacturers of products such as HVAC and refrigeration equipment, appliances, water heating systems, lighting, building controls, and distributed and renewable energy systems. So these are our key team players, but we also work with many Better Buildings Alliance members and other industry experts. Next slide. So a couple team announcements on upcoming activities and research. So first off, we are formulating a Buildings to Grid Working Group for Better Buildings Alliance members that is focused on strategic integration renewables energy storage, building load flexibility, and grid coordination. We recognize that the growing peak electricity demand 
transmission and distribution infrastructure constraints and an increasing share of variable renewable energy generation are challenging the electrical grid. We are looking for participants to join discussions around demand flexibility and how buildings can help by reducing energy waste, balancing energy during times of peak demand and or with renewable generation, and by reducing the risk of frequency deviations, since all of this can really play an important role in maintaining grid reliability, improving energy affordability, and integrating a variety of generation sources. So we are also looking for Better Buildings members that would be interested in participating in um, two studies. Uh, they don't have to participate in both studies, but they could be interested in one or the other. Um, the first is a study to understand the load flexibility potential for a portfolio of buildings. This would require access to building and portfolio level energy consumption and demand data, building end use, uh, building use type and other characteristics, and information about enrollment and demand response or similar services. Um, the second study is a field study looking at individual buildings. Uh, buildings participating in this field study would be requested to implement building load flexibility solutions that can cost effectively provide building load flexibility and reduce energy consumption and peak demand. Um, as part of this, the Department of Energy would fund a third party validation process at each test site. So if you're interested in joining the working group, either or both studies, or if you have any general questions about uh, the work that we're proposing here or the team, please email myself and my colleague here at NREL, Salam Hale. And again, I will be sending these slides out so you'll have our email addresses. Next slide. And lastly, before we jump into our technical presentations, um, I want to announce that we will be having team calls approximately every other month for the renewables integration team. If you missed the call, our last call on building load flexibility and grid coordination, you can find our slide deck and a recorded presentation on the Better Building Solutions Center, which I have the link here on the slide. Uh, similarly, we will be posting these slides to the slides from today's call to the Solutions Center as well, so you can share them with your colleagues or reference them at a later date. Again, any questions that arise, please email us um, for these questions. Please email myself and Theo Kasuga from, from Navigant. Next slide. Now I'd like to introduce our presenters. Today, um, the first presenter will be Myung Su Jun. He's a researcher and electrical engineer in NREL's Transportation and Hydrogen Systems Center. He's been with NREL for over eight years and his research has focused on grid integration of electric vehicles, communication among electric vehicles, charging stations and the utility grid, charging and discharging control of electric vehicles and estimation of battery states. Um, he will be presenting for approximately 20 minutes and then um, will be followed by our next presenter, Tristan Coffin, who is responsible for engineering, coordination, and built environment sustainability, including environmental health and safety, resource and facilities management in the Northern California region of Whole Foods Market. He also works on global sustainability initiatives for Whole Foods as part of the company's decentralized collaborative approach to its sustainability program or platform, uh, including flagship projects such as its rooftop PV portfolio, energy management systems, and natural refrigerant system arch architectures. Uh, so welcome, you guys, and, and thank you for joining today. We are excited to hear your presentation. So next slide. First, we will kick off our presentations with Myung-Soo Jun. Welcome, Myung-Soo. Next slide. Okay. Hello. Uh, the, my name is Myung-Soo Jun, and uh, I'll uh, be talking about uh, um, the EV charging station, how is the, the trend of the EV charging station is going on, and how to uh, the how is the impact of the charging station on the grid side and uh, to uh, alleviate that impact, the how to manage the charging station. And that is the uh, topics that I will talk, uh, will cover in this presentation. Next slide. So uh, this is uh, the, uh, the, the bar graph of US sales of uh, plug-in uh, 
cars, including the plug-in hybrid and the plug-in uh, battery car. So as you can see, that the, uh, the sales of those uh, plug-in vehicles uh, is uh, continuously increasing and uh, uh, over the year. And the next slide. And uh, accumulated numbers of uh, plug-in vehicles uh, is quite uh, significantly increased uh, over the year. So that means that the, as uh, the increased number of the, the plug-in vehicle sales, we need the, the charging station infrastructure to charge the uh, to provide electricity to those cars. So next slide. So that is uh, the charging station uh, uh, numbers, uh, and uh, so uh, uh, as the uh, uh, the uh, increase the number of the plug-in uh, vehicle sales, uh, the, the, you can see that the, uh, the number of charging station is also increased uh, as well, and uh, proportionally. So next slide. And uh, this is uh, the kind of uh, relationship between the gas price and electric vehicle sales. But at the beginning of uh, the sales of uh, the plug-in vehicles, uh, the gas price is quite, uh, the sales of the plug-in vehicles is quite uh, dependent on the gas price. So that in the early years, the, when the gas price is high, then uh, the sales of the plug-in vehicle increased but recently it does not that related because of uh, people thinking about the, some environment and also thinking about the, some air pollution so that the, recently that the gas price is uh, not the biggest factor in the sales uh, of the plug-in vehicle that's the good sign that means that the, uh, that we uh, anticipate that the sales of plug-in vehicle will continue to increase uh, the not uh, that dependent on the gas price. So next slide. So then uh, what is the problem on the grid side with the increased number of the, uh, the uh, plug-in vehicles? So the, for the residential uh, the side, so the usually the uh, the, if uh, the people get back home after work, then the, from the simulation, the demand by the electric uh, car charging increased on the early evening. So it's, uh, you can see that on the first uh, plot, so that the, there's a inc uh, the significant inc uh, demand on the early evening. So that is a significant if uh, it is combined with uh, the P, uh, PV generation because the PV gen generation uh, will decrease uh, the late afternoon and early evening. So that reduce the PV generation and increase uh, the combination of reduce the PV uh, generation and increase the uh, the, uh, the, the, P, uh, the electric char uh, charger demand will significantly impact on the grid side. So that is uh, the, for the, uh, the residential charging. And also if we uh, assume that about the 14% of a light duty vehicle adoption uh, for the electric car, uh, the front, uh, in the, uh, the Sacramento uh, Municipal uh, Utility uh, District, Territory, then uh, we uh, observed that, that uh, there's a voltage violation due to the increased demand by the charging station, and uh, about the 26% of substation, and also we uh, from the simulation almost 70% transformer, uh, transformer might need to be replaced by uh, the bigger capacity. So that is a uh, quite uh, a significant impact on the grid side. So the, in the but uh, it costs a lot to replace or upgrade uh, the, a lot of uh, transformer or the substation, uh, the facility. So in the meantime, what we should do. So that is uh, the, the 
that is uh, the, our research topic, and we looked at that, the, the motivation. We looked into the, uh, the, the management of the charging station. Next slide. And this is uh, another uh, the, uh, thing that the, we have to consider the, the uh, charging station management. Uh, the, unlike the, the residential uh, area, for the commercial building, the electricity billing system is a little bit different. So the, for the residential uh, the house, the, usually the electric uh, the building is based on the energy consumption. But for the commercial building, it is a combination of energy consumption and also the demand peak, or monthly demand peak. That is called uh, the demand charge. So if uh, the monthly demand peak is, uh, for example, like one megawatt, then it's, uh, the demand charge is quite expensive, like uh, up to $35 per kilowatt. So that, is, uh, that means that if we can reduce the, the monthly peak by just uh, 100 kilowatts, then the cost of saving is 3,500. So, so that is uh, the big factor and uh, for from the, uh, the commercial building uh, perspective. So next slide. So, and uh, NREL is also uh, the, uh, the electricity building uh, the structure is uh, the combination of energy consumption, energy charge, and demand charge. And uh, demand charge is also a yeah, significant uh, a factor in our uh, in, uh, electricity cost. So, so we ha ha used to have uh, the yeah, 36 charging station at the garage. Now that we have uh, 72 charging stations, and uh, as of uh, the 2018, the, we have had 165 uh, electric vehicle users. And that means uh, that the, there are a lot of uh, drivers, electric car drivers, and limited number of charging station. And charging station is always busy, almost. And uh, that uh, the, we need to manage the charging station to uh, maximize the, the uh, utilization of resource and to reduce the electricity cost. The so next slide. So and when we look at the, uh, the electricity cost and the energy consumption by the charging station and energy uh, the uh, the power demand. Uh, from the uh, charging station, the energy consumption by the charging station is quite uh, consistent because of uh, the, the fixed number of charging station. But the demand is uh, quite different depending on the time of use. And uh, next slide. So that is the uh, the table. If we do the, uh, the reduce the, uh, the demand and the charge management, what is the cost saving, possible cost saving? So because of uh, uh, the, the, a little bit fixed the number of charge, uh, the car and the charging station, we cannot reduce the, the energy uh, consumption by the charging station. But by spreading out the, uh, the load throughout the day, we can reduce the, the uh, peak demand. So by reducing that peak demand, we can save the, the uh, demand charge. So from the table, pr uh, the probably the best, uh, uh, with the best charging management, we can save, uh, we could have saved uh, more than $1,000 in uh, electricity cost. So next slide, a month. So, but the bad thing about uh, uh, level two DC, uh, the AC charging station standard, the charging station does not uh, have uh, battery uh, state of charge information. 
That means that the, well, at the time of a uh, plug-in, the charging station does not know the, uh, what is the battery state, uh, uh, the 50% full or 80% full, and how much energy should be delivered uh, to, the, uh, to the car to fully charge the battery. So the one way, uh, a way that we took to estimate what is the energy amount to be delivered to the car is to request each drivers to enter the energy request and also departure time. So that means that the, at the time of plug-in, user enters, oh, I need such as uh, 20 miles on, of energy until 5 p.m., things like that. Then uh, the charge management system knows that, oh, how much energy should be delivered to this uh, driver by uh, 5 p.m. That means that if one user uh, just uh, request uh, needs a uh, 10 kilowatt hour for uh, five hours, and uh, the other user needs five kilowatt hour for two hours. That means that the uh, the second user has a little bit uh, higher priority to the first user because they uh, the second user needs the energy by the shorter time period. So that is, uh, we can, based on that information, we can distribute load by the charging station. So next slide. So that is one example of uh, uh, the charge management. So the, the yellow line is uh, campus lead load, and the blue line is uh, a power demand by the charging station. So around uh, 11, 11 a.m., uh, the campus landlord significantly increased because on that day, there is a big uh, a cloud and a storm in, that, uh, in the afternoon. So that uh, we have a, a three megawatt of PV generation. So because, but uh, on that day, because of the cloud and the storm, the PV generation significantly reduced. That contributes to the high increase in the campus landlord. So the, when the campus landlord increased, the, the charge management system started to cut the power of the charging station. That's why the, the, uh, there's a big drop in the blue line. So with that, uh, thanks to that uh, charge management, we uh, saved almost $500 on that day. So that, next slide. Yeah, so that is uh, the, our uh, the task and uh, uh, result for the, for the charge management, uh, charging station management for the, uh, the level two AC charger. And now that we have, uh, have more and more uh, this best charger, the 50 kilowatt hour, uh, watt charging station, this best charger, but the, uh, uh, to charge the car just uh, like in 20 minutes or something like that. So the, the, the purpose of the DC fast charger is to provide a quick uh, charge. So that the, if we use the DC fast charger, there's a, it, it doesn't uh, make sense to reduce the power uh, power of the uh, DC pass charger because if we reduce the power, there is no uh, purpose for the uh, DC pass charger. So when we uh, use the DC pass charger, then uh, it is better uh, uh, to use uh, the stationary energy storage to mitigate uh, the peak demand. So next slide. Uh, next slide. It's, uh, okay. Uh, okay. Next slide. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. So that is our setup. So that the uh, left picture is a DC pass, a 50 kilowatt DC pass charger, and right picture is a 40 kilowatt hour stationary battery system. So the when uh, 
you uh, the a, a car is uh, using the DC fast charger, there's a moment um, uh, momentary uh, the increase in the uh, the power. So that increase of the power it can be alleviated alleviated by discharging the stationary battery. So next slide. Yeah, that, this is the uh, test result. So uh, the building load is a blue, dark blue line, and uh, dotted brown line is the building load without uh, the stationary battery system compensation. So you can see that there's a high jump and the dotted brown, brown line. But uh, with the, uh, the stationary battery system, the dark blue line is uh, less than the peak, has a less peak. So once uh, the car is uh, a DC pass charger is used, and then uh, that uh, power is compensated by stationary battery system, we can reduce the, uh, the t that building load. So that is the, the combination of a stationary battery system and DC pass charger without uh, reducing uh, the, the, the uh, without uh, impacting the advantage of DC fast charger. Next slide. Yeah. So the we uh, annual tested uh, with the uh, charge management uh, the. In two cases, uh, the one is for the, uh, the level two AC charger and one for the DC 50 kilowatt DC fast charger. So for the uh, the AC charger, the users uh, uh, expect that it will take hours to uh, fill up the uh, uh, the battery, so that we can have a lot of margin. Uh, to manage the, uh, the charging station based on the uh, departure time and the energy user the energy need. But uh, for the uh, DC fast charger, user usually expect from the DC fast charger, oh, I need a very quick energy. I'm very, I'm very urgent. So in that scenario, so we need uh, the stationary battery system to compensate that and alleviate the total building load. So that is uh, the uh, the NRS, uh, the experiment and test to reduce the, the uh, impact of the charging station on the grid and also building load, and also the to save a uh, demand charge uh, from the building owner's perspective. And uh, that makes the, with that uh, charge management, uh, we uh, anticipate that uh, it will motivate uh, the commercial building owners to install uh, the more uh, charging station without uh, much increased maintenance cost and electricity cost. Okay, next. I think that's the last slide. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Myung Su. That was a great um, overview of uh, more where we're headed with with this building grid integration with electric vehicle charging and how we can best integrate electric vehicle charging into our buildings uh, while continually managing our peak load. Um, so yes, if, if the audience, if anybody, uh, any attendees have questions, remember please type your questions into the question box and we will get to them during the Q&A session at the end. Um, with that, I'd like to go to our next technical presentation, which will be about 20 minutes from Tristam Coffin at Whole Foods Market, um, who will be presenting more on a, you know, what are our better buildings uh, uh, members doing with electric vehicle charging at their own building. So Tristan, welcome. Thank you very much for having me. Move to the next slide, that'd be great. Uh, fantastic. Well, as Royce uh, just mentioned, it's going to be 
talking through the evolution of implementing uh, EV charger infrastructure at Whole Foods Market um, across our enterprise, uh, specifically here in North America. Uh, head to the next slide, please. So speaking to the, the early days of electrical vehicle charging, um, and you saw the, the graph that uh, Nung Zhu shared um, earlier in terms of adoption of both EV, um, obviously electric vehicles, and then the charging infrastructure and how it's, it's followed quite closely to one another, um, though not always in the areas that um, we need to see. We need to see chargers per se, but um, for us, the early days really was um, just 120 um, volt outlets um, at the parking lot and we saw very little usage and this was um, kind of early 2010 time frame um, whereby we hadn't even started to even focus on level one charging stations or, or even had any thought around level two or what the future may hold so we'll go to the next slide please Enter probably about 2011 time frame. We started looking at um, level one charging stations, um, which you know were, were fairly short lived. I think we probably total across the entire company at that point in time, we probably had just under 400 stores company wide. Uh, we may have had about I would say 10 um, total level one charging stations, most of which have now been removed um, or replaced with level two or DC fast chargers. So we'll. Move to the next slide, please. So level level two charging stations uh, began to go in um, probably around the 2012-2013 timeframe, um, and still today are really the lion's share uh, of what we have out there. Um, but I'll speak to a little bit more of the complications around uh, level two charging stations, especially in the retail space. And I think Moon um, Zoo really gave a, a good outline of some of the challenges we face, but I'll, I'll go into a little deeper detail as it relates to, like I said, the retail environment um, and just commercial buildings in general. So move to the next slide, please. So where, where are we today with electric vehicle charging? Um, so we have about 350 um, chargers total. Uh, so we have about 500 locations uh, across North America, that being uh, predominantly in the US, um, several stores in Canada, and then we do have a, um, a small region in the UK, but most of these um, chargers are located in, in North America. Um, and <clears throat> not all of our locations, of course, have charging stations. Um, as you can see, if we have 500 locations, we have just over 350 chargers. Um, but I would say probably about, I don't know, maybe 50% at best, of our stores, um, you know, have or excuse me, the 150 stores total, um, and that that's ever increasing. So um, it's it's really evolving, literally by the day. Um, whether that be new stores opening uh, with charger count or um, installations of new chargers going into existing locations. So um, we're not quite at 50%, but we'll be at 50% here here fairly shortly of our of our total store count overall. And of those um, 350 chargers, our fast charger count <clears throat> is around 50, um, and that is ever increasing as well. And uh, as I mentioned before, I'll, I'll speak a little bit more to the advantage of fast chargers, um, as we, we did talk a little bit about the disadvantages from a demand perspective uh, earlier in the presentation. But I think it's important um, to understand, obviously, the pros and cons of, of the fast charger um, outlet. And moving to the next slide, please. So how have we implemented um, EV charging stations across our enterprise? Um, as I mentioned before, the early days, you know, it was a capital purchase um, or it was literally running conduit to a um, 120 volt outlet in, in the parking lot in the very early days. Um, since then, um, you know, our model has, has evolved. And I think as it has with most um, commercial real estate, um, especially, you know, retail, fast paced environments, um, you know, we're, we are not in the business of, uh, of operating gas stations. I, you know, some of our competitors in the marketplace do operate gas stations. That's not, um, you know, it's not our core business. So we really relied on, um, you know, whether it be electric fueling stations or um, traditional um, fueling stations, we've really relied on outside um, partners to, uh, to provide those services. Um, so with that being said, we have three primary partners uh, today. 
um, all of whom have three um, separate models. Um, and each model differs, um, you know, depending on the offering. Uh, and I can speak a little bit more to that if folks have questions. Um, most folks are probably familiar with those those models, um, but you know, at a very very high level, some rely on advertising. Um, to provide free charging at the stations, um, you know, some are, are a paid model uh, and and others, uh, you know, if depending on the vehicle that you um, own or drive will we'll give you um, access to specific charging stations. So all the models are slightly different. I think they are beginning to narrow down to a common or similar type uh, type model, which I think is, is essentially pay to, pay to charge. But um, at this point in time, each model is, is slightly different. Uh, and, and for us, you know, it's been interesting to try to navigate uh, what our customers um, and users of these stations are, are looking for. And I think today, because, you know, the adoption continues uh, in the EV space continues to evolve, literally, I, I think in many respects by, by the day, um, I don't think there is one model that serves, uh, serves every um, EV driver out there on the, uh, on the roads today. Um, so, you know, it'll likely continue to be a, um, a mix uh, mixed solution in terms of what we what we offer uh, and we're constantly exploring other other partners in the marketplace and, and what they can potentially bring to the table um, from both a technology perspective um, you know a customer service perspective and just an overall offering uh, as I alluded to previously the the host first purchase uh, model um, you know it, it really comes down to that that question of core competency um, you know we're, we're in the grocery business we're not in um, the EV business or EV charger business. So we really um, have leaned on um, today and likely will in the future our, our partners uh, to offer the services of, of EV charging versus um, us you know, being the, the sole provider of, of those services. So we, uh, we consider ourselves a host in most instances, although we still do own chargers out there. Um, the model of, of hosting, like I said, the, the EV charging um, partner stations has, uh, has served us well and I think has served our customers far better than we would be able to if we tried to get um, outside of our core competency of, of selling um, you know, the highest quality products, i.e. broccoli and things of those sort, and dove uh, headfirst into the EV charging space. Uh, and then technology versus provider choice. I, um, I think, you know, that, that's what I was getting at before in terms of the different partner models um, and the technologies that they employ. Um, and then, of course, you know, what the, the choices that they offer to our customers um, provide at, uh, under any one of those given models. So move to the next slide, please. So uh, you, you can see some of the updated um, systems today. Um, so pay stations, uh, along with both level two and, uh, and DC fast chargers, uh, you know, these are predominantly located, um, the DC fast chargers, I should say, are predominantly located in California, um, though we do have them in, in other uh, major metropolitan areas. Um, and and they, again, the, the DC fast chargers, um, from a parking space turnover perspective, really serve us quite well. And I'll go into a little bit more detail on that in a moment. We'll move to the next slide, please. I think one of the other things to note on that previous slide is, is accessibility um, and that, you know, the, some of the challenges, but also opportunities in, in locating these, uh, these charging stations um, with the various partners that we're working with that you can see in these photos. So, um, you know, really um, obviously providing pervert, preferred parking um, for, EV, um, for EV charging stations uh, and obviously the vehicles that are going to be using them um, is, is paramount. Um, it also has led to a bit of conflict, as I mentioned before, as the adoption of EVs um, continue in the marketplace and um, those that, that haven't quite adopted those yet or not even adopted them, but adopted the, uh, I guess, realization that they're, that they're coming um, to the market quite quickly and, and that they will likely take over in, in the next decade or so as, you know, um, the, new, the new normal. Um, so again, you know, all, all things to consider and all things that we've um, I don't want to say struggled with, but certainly have, have found as obstacles, but also opportunities uh, as we either implement an existing um, parking lots or look to uh, look to put into new builds. Next slide, please. So just some other, um, you know, EV charging stations. These are the fast charger 
um, chargers, I should say. Um, and, you know, we, these, this is actually a recent expansion. Um, so, you know, looking to continue to expand in that space uh, based on demand. So, you know, we're closely tracking the demand of each of the stations, um, you know, some depending on obviously location um, and um, transit corridors, et cetera. It, you know, there's, there's no exact science to date, but we are with our partners tracking um, opportunities for expansion and where it makes sense to really hone in on the opportunity to offer more to our customers and more to the EV drivers out there, which, you know, maybe our customers today or maybe our customers in the future as a result of us being able to provide um, those services and in most cases, critical services. Next slide, please. So just kind of a, you know, key questions and, and takeaways. And when I say key questions, uh, it's oftentimes the questions that, that we're asking ourselves um, and then some of the takeaways or lessons learned uh, to date in the implementation process. Um, you know, level two versus DC fast charging. You've kind of heard that, um, I think, throughout or that, that I guess, um, question mark probably throughout my presentation. And, and really the big thing for us is level two uh, makes a whole lot of sense, I think, for home charging um, or workplace charging. And, and many of you will, will probably be asking the question around, well, you know, you're a workplace, but also a retail environment. So we have, uh, we have struggled with that obstacle. And um, folks that, that work for Whole Foods have, you know, asked that, asked that question of, uh, of folks like myself on a number of occasions, um, you know, why we've started to move more towards DC fast chargers, um, which, you know, some of the vehicles that our team members are, are driving, um, not compatible for. Uh, and, you know, the, the answer is, you know, though um, we want to obviously support our team members, um, you know, our, our parking spaces are generally designated, especially those preferred parking spaces today are generally designated for our customers and, and turning those spots over um, quickly and uh, is, is kind of important to the retail environment so that, um, you know, we can uh, make sure that, you know, we have um, parking space is turning over and our customers are able to get their shopping done and, and be able to charge your vehicles um, quickly and, and efficiently and, and move on. So it's an ongoing question mark in many respects as to how we balance um, the level two versus DC fast charging uh, offering um, and whether or not we begin to offer, offer level two for um, more of the workplace environment, i.e. our team members, as you'll see in a lot of office, um, office environments, et cetera. Um, you know, the, the challenge there is, is you, you oftentimes, unless you're going to be running conduit from the transformer that's normally located closer to the building, to the back of a parking area, you begin to run into challenges in terms of infrastructure. So I think there's, it's important to note that there's still a lot of obstacles and questions um, that have, have gone unanswered, but we, we and, uh, and our other partners are continuing to, to explore those opportunities. But Right now, today, I'll say that the DC fast chargers are, are certainly taking priority, um, at least at Whole Foods, in terms of being the best offering uh, as as a retail um, EV charging infrastructure. System and, and connector consistency. Um, so, I mean, I'm not going to go into too much depth on this. I think folks are, you know, still aware of, of course, um, and I'm not going to point out certain um, EV charger infrastructure, EV vehicles in, in the marketplace, but you know there's still a lack of consistency across um, the charger infrastructure, specifically in the DC fast charger space, and um, you know how uh, certain vehicles are compatible. And we run into issues where we'll have DC fast chargers, we'll have level two charging stations, um, but there's still a demand for other offerings out there. And uh, our challenge is then co-locating and exclusivity and um, diving into the details of, of what that looks like, um, you know, from a competition perspective, um, from, you know, us as the host and the, the providers as those that are offering um, similar but also different services to um, the EV drivers on, on the road today. Um, parking space turnover and, and exclusive designation. So I, I did allude to this uh, on the previous slide, but uh, you know, this has probably been one of our, our greatest challenges. Um, you know, there we have signed and, and etched out, um, you know, in the parking spaces themselves, EV only parking, um, you know, which I, I think is important and it's certainly offering priority and it's in line with 
our um, you know environmental sustainability um, core values and uh, it's I think important and most folks on the call would probably recognize it as, as something um, that would be considered a good thing uh, however we obviously have to balance the perspectives of um, hundreds of thousands uh, or I should say millions of, of customers and not all of those customers drive EV um, today and um, when we provide that exclusive designation um, it, it inevitably creates conflict unfortunately so um, you know balancing again the turnover of parking spaces um, offering that exclusive designation and preferred parking um, in a retail environment can be a, a, a balancing act to say the very least so um, you know whether and then I think the big question there just to, to sum that piece up is you know whether we enforce uh, the parking and we've taken a stance that we will sign um, and provide stenciling on the parking spaces but we're not going to enforce um, whether or not it's an EV or you know a gas-powered vehicle or the like uh, in those spaces uh, just to you know uh, obviously it's important to promote um, that service and uh, the value that it brings to both both our customers that drive EVs as well as of course the environment but being cognizant of the fact that um, we don't want to necessarily alienate other customers that may not have uh, have met that adoption rate as quickly as some of our others and then you know the previous presentation spoke largely to um, the challenges in terms of um, impacts on the grid um, both locally and, and over um, and above across the across the, the nation um, and it is uh, it is something that that we're paying very close attention to uh, I mentioned the host models and what we've done in those host models is um, look to provide a separate utility meter however that doesn't necessarily solve the grid problems it helps us significantly in terms of our demands um, charge fees not escalating as um, as you know the chargers are used specifically the DC fast chargers um, but it doesn't really necessarily um, support the grid infrastructure or the challenges that the grid infrastructure will face as a result of wider adoption um, so we are talking about um, as was presented um, you know coupling with energy storage systems and, and the like um, but you know it's we're space constrained, I think, is the biggest challenge in many respects, um, you know, in terms of the infrastructure that we can employ, especially at existing facilities. Uh, so those are there and lie some of the challenges. Um, and then, you know, the overall planning for increased usage, um, both uh, where um, we're offering stations and where we're, we're not offering stations and both that's usage, um, you know, obviously, and the uptick of the charging stations actually being utilized, but of course, the subsequent usage of, of electricity that goes along with that um, and then charger expansion um, you know if, if we could expand to all of our stores today um, you know it would certainly provide uh, I think a, a great opportunity for um, you know offering services to EV drivers and probably help expand the, the marketplace um, but it's it's a uh, again a balancing act in terms of making sure that we are strategically locating um, and not, you know, jumping the gun in terms of offering those services where they're not going to be used, which then again, you know, plays into the exclusive designations and um, and some of the challenges that go along with that. But what I will say is overall, it's uh, it's been an extremely positive um, evolution. Uh, we're excited to be a part of um, that evolution and the offering of uh, EV charging services with a number of host or a number of excuse me providers um, partner providers out there in the marketplace and um, continue to uh, to have our eye keen on opportunities for newer technologies and newer product offerings that are coming to the marketplace and just really appreciate the partnership with uh, Better Buildings Alliance and um, the team that's um, co-presenting on the on the call today because without those partnerships. Um, you know, we, we certainly want to be at the forefront of um, EV charging infrastructure or even beginning to scratch the surface of that. So thank you to everyone for having us. And I think with that, we'll, uh, we'll open it up to questions. Great. Thanks so much, Tristan. That was um, a great presentation on what Whole Foods is currently doing. Um, just a reminder to the attendees, if you have questions, please type them into the question box and we will respond to them now. Uh, we have about 10 minutes for questions. Um, I'd like to kick it off with one for Myung Su. Um, 
and it's more around the your conversation about really continuously managing the demand of electric vehicle charging and having them be more flexible. So the question is, how commercially available is this uh, via the data management um, and, and how you can um, manage how energy is delivered to individual cars to distribute that load? Uh, yeah, so the uh, charging uh, management system we developed is uh, our, our own development, but uh, there are uh, the, a couple of uh, uh, the companies that do the uh, charging management. I think, and also the system, uh, charging management system we developed is uh, now that the, uh, for, it was uh, started as a research program and then uh, the charging station was uh, about uh, eight years old. So now that the, uh, the from the, I think that the uh, beginning on the June, uh, first uh, this month, this month that the, we replace uh, all the uh, the old charging station was replaced by the new charging station, and we uh, have have uh, had a contractor uh, to install new charging station, and uh, that uh, the co uh, contractor has their own uh, charge management system. So similar to the system we developed, so they have uh, the mobile app uh, to get uh, the yeah, departure time and the miles, those kind of things, uh, the similar to uh, the, our system. And then uh, they do the, also, they also uh, the get uh, the in our campus load meter. Then uh, based on that, they yeah, they manage the, uh, the peak, uh, uh, the charging station. So I think uh, the, uh, the other than that the company oh, we uh, have a contract, I think that there are another uh, a couple of uh, the companies to the some kind of uh, the charge management uh, for the commercial building or uh, the uh, the workspace charging things. Yeah. Great. So that is a service that is can be contracted out. Yeah. yeah that right. Now that the, yeah, the, yeah, yeah, the service is contracted out now. At the beginning uh, the this month. Yeah. Great. Um, and it seems like that is uh, to, I think Tristan made this comment to maybe more appropriate on, on for commercial buildings like offices where people are parked there for the majority of the day. Um, and then integrating battery storage and managing peak demand on that side would be more effective for uh, a retail store like Whole Foods um, or grocery store there. So yeah, thank you for that. Uh, the second question I have is actually for Whole Foods, and it's around your your financing structure for um, the electric vehicle charging. Um, did your rates and structures change, or are they in some? Or are you? I guess you said you are in some sort of service contract. Or can you speak a little bit more to that, Tristan? Yeah, sure, sure thing. So the we're not financing um, the EV charging infrastructure. Um, in most instances today, uh, we had previously allocated capital for the purchase of um, certain infrastructure, mostly level two charging stations. Uh, today, it's it's in partnership. So the the um, most of the charging stations that you see at our stores, especially, or I should say, in all cases, the DC fast chargers. Um, so those are solely owned, operated, and, and serviced um, by the partner organizations. So um, they, they finance that. We essentially host um, and, and um, coordinate, obviously, um, you know, the, the electrical um, connections, et cetera, and, and almost all instances have prioritized um, a separate utility meter for those services. Uh, but in some instances, they are coming off of, uh, they are behind our panel or meter, I should say. Uh, and in that case, there's there's submetering in place. So that's really the um, only kind of, I guess you could say, uh, financial um, connection that, that we have other than obviously an agreement that dictates what that relationship looks like. 
Great. And then building off oh. of the last question, I know you spoke to this briefly, but um, are you already implementing batteries or is that something you're, you're looking at for offsetting demand charges? Yeah, so we have battery storage systems for, um, you know, we're in the midst of deploying those across a number of facilities um, and, you know, strategic areas across the country, um, or facilities, um, that is, and uh, they're not necessarily tied to the EV charging infrastructure today. So um, what I was getting at before is, uh, you know, we've we've done ourselves a favor, I guess, in many respects it relate, as it relates to dam demand charges by um, in most instances, and I'd say about 95% of the time, uh, ensuring that the partner provider of the EV charging infrastructure has their own utility meter. However, that is obviously still somewhat of a disfavor to the, the grid. Um, so, you know, working with them in both instances, whether they're behind our meter or have their own meter to look at energy storage that can be coupled with their systems. But um, we have not employed the two side by side um, to date, but it is something we're, we're considering and taking a close look at. Great. Uh, another question came in is, uh, are your charging stations compatible for all kinds of electric vehicles? Yeah, it's a good question, and I and I did speak to a little bit of that um, in the presentation. So you know, the level level twos are, are you know it's pretty much a common um, connector at this point in time. Uh, the DC fast chargers, um, you know, they don't have a consistent or common um, connector. So it's uh, there are obviously um, adapters that can be used. Uh, that that is one of the challenges that we face, and uh, you know it. I, it's everyone's challenge, right? It's not just our challenge. Um, it's the it's the market's challenge to figure out where we're going. And uh, you know, I don't want to point fingers at any um, one provider of both EVs or the charging infrastructure. But I think there, um, you know, is a need for more consistency so that um, we can offer the value of of any station um, across every EV. Um, but we're we're not there yet, of course. And I and I think we're quickly evolving towards that. Um, destination, but um, still some some room for improvement. Great, thank you. Uh, we might have time for one or two more questions here. This one goes out to I think both of you guys, Myung Su and Tristan. Uh, which communication protocols are are being used in electric vehicle chargers and battery storage? Oh, <clears throat> yeah, this is Myung Su. Uh, the communication for level two charger is uh, uh, not. There's no standard for that. And uh, now for the DC fast charger, there are the uh, so usually the, the three types uh, the, in the market. One is the uh, Chadmo, uh, uh, developed by the Nissan and the Tokyo Energy, and the then used the uh, uh, CAN communication. And uh, the other is, uh, the second one is uh, called the CC, uh, CCS. It's uh, developed by the uh, SAE and uh, by consortium with the US automakers and European automakers. That uses the power line communication. And the last one is a supercharger by Tesla. That is the, that pro, uh, the pro, uh, standard is uh, just used by Tesla and is a uh, not open to the uh, public, so I don't know that the, what kind of communication the supercharger is used. And uh, for the stationary battery system, there's no standard, but uh, usually it is uh, integrated into the building system. So a lot of uh, uh, the building controller and meters uh, uses Modbus communication protocol. Uh, but our uh, battery system uses the CAN communication. Great, thank you. And one final question that I actually have, and what is the projection for uh, two-way communication with electric vehicle charging. Oh, what, oh, what do you mean to two layer? Or? 
thinking, I guess thinking more as, as leveraging the batteries in electric vehicles as battery storage for the building potentially. Uh, sorry, I, I don't get <laughs> Uh, that's okay. I've I've heard of some systems, and I think after um, mm -hmm. or, uh, one of the companies, a Japanese company, uh, came up with an electric vehicle charger that enabled to use the batteries in, in within an electric vehicle as battery storage for a building oh, itself so you mean, uh, in emergency. Just, yeah, yeah. So you mean that the, the use use of the the car, uh, the electric car battery as a, the backup battery or the, just to provide the power to the grid or home, those kind of thing, the the vehicle yes, to grid exactly. operation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So th there's a uh, the, some uh, research uh, the task uh, the regarding the, the vehicle to grid operation, and uh, but still it's ongoing. So there is no uh, the uh, the uh, uh, the standard. Uh, there's a lot of the. Uh, some standard about the communication and interfaces about the vehicle to grid operation, but there is no the, uh, the consensus. So that there is not one only one standard for the everything. So uh, and also there is uh, some uh, the testing by Nissan using the Chadmo standard to, to, to providing uh, the backup power. To home, so grid to home. So in uh, in the uh, event uh, in the case of emergency and power outage at the home, yeah. So, but uh, it's a still yeah ongoing uh, the project or <laughs> yeah. Great, thank you, Myung Su. Yeah, interesting. Uh, well, thank you. My last question put us over by one minute. Um, if we could advance to the very last slide. Uh, thank you to all the attendees who called in. Thank you very much to our two presenters. We really appreciate your time and input on the electric vehicle conversation. Um, if you have any questions, please email myself at rose.langner at nrel.gov. And please also stay tuned for upcoming announcements of our next team calls. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.